the best part about living here for me is having like really deep family roots. It's like really connected to the history. And one of the things nice about this job is I'm really able to like transfer that history in my head to people a couple hours at a time. Because really we're giving people access to history, but like in a real way too. It's like, you know, this boat's 95 years old, but the technology of the boat's like 200 years old. Right. And they were building all these ships in Camden 200 years ago, and it was one of the biggest shipbuilding ports in the United States at the time, so. My family has lived in this state for longer than the United States has been in the United States, so we've been here a while. Your last name is? Lincoln. <laughs> There's basically three land grants in Maine here, and they were the three generals underneath Washington during the end of the Revolutionary War. Like, we couldn't pay our generals really that well at the end of the war, so we gave them land instead. And so Benjamin Lincoln, who I'm descended from, was one of the three generals that owned land here. But if you know them, it's Samuel uh, Waldo, Henry Knox, and Benjamin Lincoln. So that's Knox, Lincoln, and Waldo County, the counties oh that are here. Oh my gosh. <laughs> nice. How special. And Benjamin Lincoln is the guy who took the sword from Cornwallis at the end of the Revolutionary War. They didn't really want to give it to Washington. They didn't really like him, but they liked my relative, apparently. So they gave it to him instead. Fantastic. True, cool. <laughs> Not a lot of people can say that. So you're steering the rudder with this. I'm sure it gets difficult some days. Yeah, like today's one of those days that probably at the end of the day I will drive primarily with my feet because it's actually easier on my body ergonomically. I have to remember none of the captains that lived on boats back, you know, 100 years ago survived as long as we do now. So ergonomics was not like a big part of it. So. Yeah. I would think that's why a lot of people do come here to trace that history, experience the history walking down the streets. but. I mean, this is a special kind of adventure in history, coming out on this vessel. Certainly it was a bonus learning about your family, Yeah. but you're kind of a custodian. Totally, just the next steward of the boat. So I think there's been 14 stewards of the boat, and I think we've all taken care of it. And I think that whenever you see a boat that's this old, that's still really well taken care of, you know, it's had a couple characteristics. Probably it's a good looking boat. I don't think a lot of the big, working boats that didn't have any charm at all are really around. And also it's a good sailing boat. Like this boat's fun to sail. Like sometimes I'm sailing somebody's fancy boat somewhere else in the world and I'm actually kind of pining for my own boat just because whatever they did right, I mean, it's got some quirks. There was no CAD machine setting up the way this thing was built, but there's just something about the way the boat sails. It's fun to sail. It's not generic at all. And um, always interesting. Huh? Yeah, I, this is our first time. And I tell you what, I am impressed. Do you notice how quiet it is? Yeah. Like even though there's a lot of wind, because the, the hull is a wooden hull, it's dampering all that noise. You don't like have this fiberglass yep. slapping noise. Yep. You're not, it's like the whole hull itself is absorbing the sound. And so all really you hear is the ocean and the wind. And we could talk like this without like yelling. I didn't even pick up on that until you just said that. He knows where we come up, yeah. come in fiberglass boats. We've been on our whole Heck lives, yeah. but this is, you're right, it's quiet. Never been on anything like this. And then when we were raising the sails, looking up it's actually just it's so beautiful it's like a little piece of art each one of these is spectacular i think that art word is a good description of what this is because some of the america's cup people have come in and out of my life through this town right some really good helmsmen from racing and they're mechanical like to a science do you know what i mean like i've learned so much from sailing with those guys but when you're on an older boat, you have to take all the quirks of the design and the way things were. You know, they just didn't know how everything worked. So they had a lot of really good assumptions or learned by trial and error. And so when you learn to sail a boat like this, it's a lot more like an art than it is just to like go sailing in a modern boat. Yeah. So they call this wind jamming, I guess. Is that kind of the catchphrase? Is that you what use we're that? doing? Kind of. Well, I mean, all of these boats that are rigged fore and aft, they called them wind jammers. It was kind of actually a slight in the back days from when the sailors from the tall ships with the square rigs went to basically um, sailing these fore and aft boats like this. So they used to say that the wind was jamming between the sails and you could hear a funneling noise, which actually, if you stand right up in the slots, you can hear that. But the wind jammers that we'll see, like some of those older boats that were coming into the harbors, it's been kind of kind of a catch-all term for these older boats that go out overnight, and then I would consider this boat a day sailing boat instead. So we're coming in on these buoys. Tell me about the bells. Back in the good old days, before we had fancy equipment, everybody would come up here, we would have a lot of fog. And so sea captains really get to know where they're from. But one of the things that's unique about those buoys is that they're all in a different key. So like as we're approaching, we just went by the uh, R2 bell, which is the main approach into Camden Harbor, but we're actually getting really close to the CH buoy, which is another approach into the harbor. 
and they're in different keys. So like say you were coming from Islesboro over here in the fog and you didn't have anything but your compass and you were doing what they call dead reckoning, you could easily get within a tenth of a mile of the harbor, right, but be just off by a little bit. Like you might be trying to come in by the R2 because you want to have the most depth and the largest area to come in the harbor because you can't see anything. If you're down near the CH buoy, you'll notice that the tone is actually flatter. And there's a gong way out there by the graves, which you don't want to be anywhere near ever. It's a really different noise. So you would know that, hey, I did my course and I was pretty close, but I heard the wrong bell. So you could turn around and make your new course for the harbor because you would know where you were at that point. Mm. Fascinating, I had no idea. Tell me what the lighthouse is off the point. That's Curtis Island Lighthouse. It's still an active lighthouse, although it only runs, like it's no longer a lighthouse keeper there. We have, the town owns it, everything but the lighthouse. So there is a lighthouse keeper who takes care of the house. But we've had that lighthouse there since the 1860s, I'm pretty sure. I think the first one was in the 1830s, and it's hard for me to believe this, but I believe there was a storm in October. It was so large that it actually washed away the original lighthouse and the lighthouse keeper's house. But when you figure that the light is 50 feet off the water, doesn't that make that like 100 foot waves? That, in my mind, it seems impossible, but it's never, you never know. know. Yeah. I do know it's the second lighthouse. I've seen the pictures. How long has this been your boat? And tell us a little bit about your business. So I've owned the boat for 16 years, but I ran it for a family five years before. Basically, I never, I just planned on taking a sabbatical to figure out what I wanted to do with my life, and I just never left. I really went from making probably some pretty good money to making pennies on the dollar for a while, but I realized I was happy. And so, like, I've made it work. You know, like, this business has done really well, and, you know, I think. I don't know, you know, I just had faith that it would work. Yeah. I don't know why, I just knew I could make it into a business. And these businesses have grown here. And part of it is the scenery. I mean, as you could just That's see, like, say. how do you beat that? And these boats are so beautiful, and it's like really special that the town of Camden has kind of like earmarked some of the public land to allow these boats to run out of here. You could never run a boat like this small most of the major sailing places now because the cost has become prohibitive. Mm -hmm. But the town of Camden has really protected that these vintage boats are still able to sail here. So that also is really special. Like we're really lucky that that happens. So if I'm, I'm somebody who wants to do this, what do I do? How do I go about booking um, you? Or? You know, organically, just walking down the docks in the summer, you could just sign up at the docks. You know, there are ticket tables there. We may be really old boats, but we all have a pretty good online presence. It is actually an amazingly competitive business too because when you think about it, there's about 6,000 passenger vessels in the United States and out of those 6,000 passenger vessels, like maybe 5% of them are sailboats, but only 5% of the sailboats are traditionally rigged like this, so it is a small, small microcosm. You can't be a bad person in this business. You wouldn't last very long because everybody knows each other. And that's the whole country, right? Like yeah. we're talking about 100 boats in the whole country. When you get to owner operators, we're like even less of a percentage of that. If you could sum up, you know, why you live here and why you do what you do. I feel like I'm a totally fortunate person, you know, like to do this. It's a pretty amazing job. Like, you know, you don't get up in the morning, like especially today I got up and I was like, oh, it's going to be a good sailing day. And of course this is a little different, but it is such a unique job in the fact that it's constantly changing. You have a different group of people every couple hours. You're always learning new people. You're also like, you know, even just how much has the weather changed or the winds just changed in this one trip. You know, you're constantly having to use your brain. Like, I love that. I could go on hours about why this job is cool. Not everything's glorious, but I also like the change of the seasons. I like that we have a down period of time and I like that it offers a time to do the woodwork and learn a whole nother set of things. I mean, you really do doing this, like anybody owns an old boat like this has to be able to work on their engine to a certain extent. And you used to be able to do the varnish and I can repair my sails if I really need to, you know, to get home. But it's also really neat being here and the fact that all of the businesses that would support this kind of work are still around. And that's what I love about this area too and we've been learning along this whole week is that the history is so rich here but that those traditions and those trades right. have kept on yeah. and I think we need more of that it's in this country and thank you for today because we got to write a little bit of history and Absolutely. learn some more and experience this so we appreciate you. Thanks, I appreciate you guys coming out. This has been great.